Good morning, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Jim Carafano, I oversee foreign and security policy here at the Heritage Foundation. And we have an extraordinary event today. And I think one that doesn't get near the attention and importance it deserves. In a Washington where we don't agree on anything, where somebody thinks it's bipartisan to have a bill that actually nobody from the other party votes for, there, there is one thing where we all ought to be coming together and paying a lot of attention to. In an era of great power competition, America's intelligence capabilities are never more important than ever. We've had a succession of presidents from Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden, who've all said, what are the great concerns? What are the great destabilizing factors in the world today? And they all list North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, among other things. But intelligence on these threats and other concerns is the front line of American security. We have not had an in-depth intelligence conversation about the reforms and the capabilities and what we're bringing to the table for over a decade, and it's long past due. And today we have an incredible opportunity for a great conversation with two unbelievable professionals who understand this issue arguably better than, than anyone. So to lead the conversation today, I'd like to introduce David Chet. David is our longtime visiting fellow here at the Heritage Foundation before coming to Heritage. He had a long and very distinguished career in the intelligence community, including the Central Intelligence Agency and serving as a director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. So no one better qualified to, to guide a conversation today on arguably the most important thing that we are not talking about. So David, over to you. Thank you, Jim. It is a delight to be here and greetings to the audience out there as well and, uh, and to have uh, former DNI John Ratcliffe with us. Most recently, uh, John was uh, in principal intelligence advisor uh, to the president and leader of the US intelligence community, which consists of 18 elements now with Space Force I being, being the last uh, additive uh, element to it. No long introduction is really needed today, but as America's top spy, Director Radcliffe directed US intelligence and counterintelligence collection platforms, covert action programs, and the analytic enterprise of this intelligence community, where I served for 33 years. Prior to his time as DNI, he served as congressman from Northeast Texas, where he served on the House Committees on Intelligence, Homeland Security, and the Judiciary. Uh, committees and prior to that served in the Department of Justice as a U.S. attorney prosecuting counterintelligence uh, cases as, as you and I have discussed before. Most recently he was named co-chairman of the Center for American Security at the America First Policy Institute. So welcome today and it is delightful to have this conversation with you. David, let me just uh, um, say it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thank Dr. Carafano and Heritage Foundation for inviting me, uh, such a great institution and the privilege to be here. But to you personally, um, I think our audience needs to know that in addition to the things that Dr. Carafano said, you also served as an advisor to me as the Director of National Intelligence on my advisory board. And uh, it was great to work with you and it's great to be with you today. Well, thank you for those kind words. As the old refrain goes, inquiring minds want to know. And in so doing, we want to know what you think about the wide array of threats that we face that are either present today or looming on the horizon and around the globe. And then also get a better understanding, as uh, Dr. Carafano suggested, how is the intelligence community positioned in terms of intelligence reforms that are still needed or building off of the intelligence reforms of approximately 15 years ago when the Intelligence Reform Act was passed? as you sat as Director of National Intelligence. To that end, I thought we would break the session down into three parts, the threats, the response, or the capabilities of the intelligence community, and then the questions that uh, will come from the audience that Dustin Carmack is going to enable uh, the, the uh, questioning of those, of, of, of those to, uh, to you. The intelligence community that you led uh, just recently, in fact, um, April 9th, 10 days ago, issued a written annual threat assessment. In that, that, that was a preamble, in fact, to the hearings that were held by both the committee that you served on on the House in terms of the 
House Permanent Select Intelligence Committee, and then to the SSCI, the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, this past week. I, I point that out because it's a great backdrop for the following questions that I have on national security as it applies to the threats that we face. And as Dr. Carafano already said, I think this is one area that as a nation, we can agree that those threats are very real, they're looming, and they're getting worse and deeper and broader in terms of what America faces. So let's focus in terms of the first question on uh, the threats that we face from China. Uh, if, if you were to think about in terms of your time as, as the uh, Director of National Intelligence, the Chinese Communist Party continues as a whole of government to in fact influence, undercut the United States and drive wedges between not only us internally inside the United States, but with our friends and allies around the globe. You have called this uh, a once in a generation challenge in your Wall Street Journal opinion uh, piece this past de December. You quote, and I quote here, the intelligence is clear. Beijing intends to dominate the US and the rest of the planet economically, militarily, and technologically. Director Ray, just this past week, once again in the worldwide threat hearing says, and I quote again, I don't think there is any country that presents a more severe threat to our innovation, our economic security, or our democratic ideals, including details that they open a new counter-espionage investigation on China every 10 hours, every 10 hours, which is a 1,300% increase in economic espionage cases, cases in recent years. So here's the question with that preamble. Is the regime in China a competitor for the United States, or is it an adversary? And what worries you most about China? And they're interrelated in terms of those two questions. So David, uh, to the first question, uh, China is both. They are both an adversary uh, and a competitor, but they should be more of a competitor and less of an adversary, and it's the other way around right now. Um, we wanna compete with China. We want to compete with anyone. Um, American greatness is founded on in competing and winning um, on a level playing field, but that's that's not what's been happening, and that's not what has allowed China to rise. And where we now see, from what you talked about, the the threat report from the intelligence community that that China is um, is our greatest adversary in the sense of the only uh, other nation state that is capable of challenging and even supplanting the U.S. Uh, as the world's superpower, economically, militarily, and technologically. Um, we talk appropriately, David, about the great power competition. That has become a, a term that we talk about in, in, in dealing with China and Russia, and I think it's appropriate, but I've coined a term within it, which is a greater power competition, and that is, that is a competition between two, the United States and China. And, and the point that I the reason that I came up with that and the reason that I talk about that is you mentioned my time in Congress on the Intelligence Committee and seeing intelligence. But when I became the director of national intelligence and I got to go on the other side of the wall or the other side of the curtain and really look at all of our intelligence for what it says, it was so clear that China and China alone uh, presented the greatest national security threat. And that wasn't something that I had seen as a member of Congress. And, and so that was one of the reasons that I did something that DNIs typically don't do. I put out an op-ed saying that they're our number one national security threat. And I was pleased to see in, um, in the unclassified report that came out and in the hearings, a recognition and a discussion about that, that China poses that greatest threat. So, um, you know, unfortunately, what worries me most, most about China now is that They've got a lot of momentum. They didn't just become our number one adversary um, overnight. We should have been talking about China, I think, more honestly, more candidly, and in recognition of, of, of how they are a near peer competitor, a, a competitor to the U.S. in so many places. And, and so now we look up, and what worries me is not only are they a near peer competitor in many places, but they've got a lo lot of momentum. And they've got a unified focus, unified in, in effort, um, 
and the way that they're approaching this, they want to replace the U.S. Um, and they have a lot of resources to devote to that and are dedicated to that. Um, within certain areas, when we talk about you know challenging us militarily, economically, and technologically, what worries me most is on the technological front. Um, China sees, um, as do all of our competitors, that that is more of an equalizer, and that the other two are are, are more dependent on that as we as we look forward. And so China's investment in things like artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and biometrics and all of those things are a, a way that they know they can close the gap with the United States even faster and compete with us even more uh, on a greater basis. And I think that's what concerns me the most when I talk about it from the perspective as the recently former director of national intelligence. And then just, just a word about that. Just a word about that uh, level of competition and the momentum that China now has seemingly goes unchallenged in terms of what they've done in Hong Kong, as an example, or seemingly what they're getting away with the Uyghurs and, and these uh, prison camps and, and that kind of activity. So I, I think you would agree that that demonstrates the kind of momentum and now with their eyes set on Taiwan is sort of the next prize that they would go after. Exactly, I think you've encapsulated it perfectly. And what you see is in all of these different places um, around the world and in different industries, if you will, um, all of those places where now uh, China is speaking openly about being our, um, our equal and our rival. And, uh, and so now we, we have to shift, just as we've done appropriately for the Soviet Union and for the threat of radical Islamic uh, is extremism, to, to recognizing China and calling China out for, for what they are and setting aside any sort of political narratives and just being honest about the intelligence. We've got to be, the intelligence is clear, David, and so we must be clear as we talk about it when we talk about China. And I think that's what's been missing, and, and I'm optimistic and hopeful that now that we're having this kind of discussion and recognition and the intelligence community is saying, no, let's put China at the top of the list that we can all get there um, and counter them in a productive way that we really should have been for the last few years, not just starting now. Yeah. And as, as we think about Russia, uh, maybe not exactly a near peer competitor, but how would you characterize the challenges that we have with Russia? Personally, I think of Russia as the great disruptor as opposed to the kind of description you have of China as someone for the longer term being this near peer and actual peer competitor slash adversary. The adversarial relationship with Vladimir Putin and the Russians tends to be more shaped around disruption. Talk a little bit about the threats that we face in terms of Russia. So uh, take nothing that I said uh, about China as a way to minimize Russia. They are extremely dangerous um, as an adversary. Um, the challenge that Rus Russia faces right now, and, and really what they want and what Putin strives for, is really sort of a multipolar um, world order where China and Russia and the United States are all on somewhat level footing and and uh, and dealing with dealing with each other the problem that russia has that china doesn't have is the united states is the world's largest economy china's number two russia's not in the top 10. Um, in fact my home state of texas has a larger economy than russia does but russia so russia is focused less on the quantitative and more on the qualitative and unfortunately for us where they may have a, a, a more limited tool toolkit, if you will, but where they decide to use it, they are very effective and in some cases more dangerous than the Chinese are. So I, I give you an example. One area, you know, China has a hard time in, in you know, they can't get in a, in a um, you know, in a race with us where economically or with China, they have to compete. But what they're doing, for instance, in places like space, um, you know, they're focusing on hypersonics and the kinds of uh, weapons that can target our satellites and our vulnerabilities there. So they're looking to, um, you know, get the most bang for the buck, if you will, and they're very good at it. And the other thing that, China, that Russia has going for it is, uh, is 
is Putin is probably the most uh, dangerous world leader there is. And because Putin has less accountability than even President Xi has, China is unified in the way that they're going about it, but Putin really gets to call the shots in Russia. And, um, and he is resolute in maintaining the relevance of, of Russia. We'll do whatever it takes to, to maintain a seat um, at the world table as opposed to China, which wants to sit at the head of the table. Right, and it's really questioning the international order, right? This is what we're seeing in terms of uh, the last several years and, and no decrease uh, uh, looking forward. You mentioned space, and this is interesting because the previous administration began to really invest heavily in that area, and the last intelligence element to join the intelligence community was the intelligence area of the J-2 of the Space Force. Right. Talk a little bit more, though, about this space competition that, that's underway now in, uh, in, in relationship to these adversaries. So uh, space is the new and highest frontier, if you will, uh, in the great power competition. And this is where China and Russia are essentially working together, where the, um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they realize that um, this is an area where the United States currently doesn't really have a near peer adversary and um, and China and Russia, um, they they are working together, if you will. They both really recognize that what they have to do is be in a position to disrupt and influence um, the United States space capabilities. So so what do I mean by that is what what people don't really appreciate, David, is how, for instance, satellite technology um, influences every aspect of American life. Everything from transportation to telecommunications to finance to agriculture. And so what you see are the Russians and Chinese developing ways to interfere with our uh, satellite capability. So that's, um, you know, uh, missiles that can take out our satellites or lasers that can blind um, the optical uh, aspects of our satellites. Those are, those are ways that they can um, deter our ability and our superiority in space. And that's one of the challenges that we have. You mentioned, you know, adding the intelligence component of Space Force to the intelligence community. I felt so strongly that, that I was the one that, that, that made that addition and, and, um, and added them as the 18th agency because that's how important this is, is this is an area where we still, as I mentioned, don't have a near peer competitor and where we really need to um, maintain our superiority moving forward. And it's important that the intelligence community continue to play the role that it does there, um, you know, for our national security posture, um, for us always to be the best. We don't have enough time to continue to delve into the threats around the world, but would you say a few words about North Korea and Iran in particular? You, you noted that Vladimir Putin is perhaps, if not the most dangerous person in the world. Maybe Kim Jong-un is a close competitor to Putin in terms of being a very dangerous player. Uh, but, but characterize a bit the threats that we face with North Korea and Iran, obviously very different ones. They are very different, and, and here's here, here at, at the basis level, here's where they're most different. Um, uh, North Korea uh, is a nuclear power, and they view uh, nuclear weapons as the best deterrent to regime change. Um, nuclear weapons are um, how they're going to maintain control um, uh, internally in their own country and to fend off. Uh, other world powers like the United States and, and remain relevant. Iran doesn't have that. They aspire to be a world, uh, I mean, a nuclear power. Um, we only have the capability to stop one of those two countries from getting a nuclear weapon, and that's, and that's Iran. And so, um, you know, the, the thing about Iran that worries us in the intelligence community is, I mentioned North Korea using nuclear weapons as a deterrent, as a way of maintaining power. We don't know what the Iranians would use a nuclear, a deliverable nuclear weapon for. Would it be for a deterrent effect or would it be for an offensive effect? And when you talk about a regime that is based on religious zealotry 
and um, and is essentially a, a, a terrorist nation, a, ter a terrorist uh, designated state. Um, the concern is making sure that that regime never gains access to a deliverable nuclear weapon. And the intelligence community is pretty clear eyed about how we go about doing that. And obviously it continues to be a major disruptor in the Middle East and in terms of our objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab countries and, and the Sunni Shia uh, long term, as I call it, the long war uh, between them. Right. I mean, one of the one of the issues not to get into, you know, uh, partisanship or politics, but but right now we've seen, you know, the Abraham Accords and peace agreements. Um, that's a result of Iran being um, weaker, poorer, and less influential um, in recent years than they had been in the decades before. And that's something that, you know, we'd certainly like to see continue um, because obviously the relative peace that we've enjoyed um, and peace agreements like we've seen in the past, you know, year, that's the trend that we want to have. We don't want, um, you know, Iran to get stronger and more influential and capable of facilitating um, Hezbollah and Hamas to engage in the kind of mayhem that they have throughout the Middle East. Well put, well put. Uh, let's shift now to the IC's capabilities and capacity to deal with these threats. We're coming at about the uh, end of two decades of fighting an asymmetrical war uh, in the post 9-11-2001 environment. And the intelligence community really lifting and moving toward that asymmetrical uh, effort in terms of dismantling and going after Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Al-Shabaab, and other uh, elements that are associates of them into this great power competition or greater power competition as you describe it. A very broad question, how well positioned as you left in January from the IC, obviously at an unclassified level, would you say the intelligence community is positioned to address the nature and the content of these types of threats that are present day and into the future? Well, I'm, I'd like to start with this, is when we talk about the intelligence community to, to give um, our, our listeners and viewers um, peace of mind is as the director of national intelligence until recently, people should be comforted by the fact that I, that I view the United States as having the best intelligence enterprise in the world still. We don't have a near peer competitor in that regard. The challenge, um, and when you talk about positioning, David, the challenge is making sure that the, the things that we've done so well in the 20th century, we have the capability to do that our intelligence enterprise continues to give us the advantage that we need in the 21st century. And we do have some challenges with respect to that. Um, one of those is, is, is talent. And when I talk about the, the challenge of talent and positioning the IC, it's, it's a number of things. It's, it's, uh, there's a phil philosophical component or challenge to it. There's a financial challenge to it. And there's a bureaucratic, a bureaucratic challenge to it. So when I say philosophical is um, folks like you, David, that have really dedicated their life to um, service of the country and uh, within the intelligence community, um, that's one of the challenges that we have with the younger generation is sort of, um, is there that mindset and do they view the United States you know, as the greatest country in the history of the world and worthy of uh, spending your professional life uh, serving? Um, when I talk about it financially, one of the challenges in, in attracting and retaining talent is, is the financial aspects, is that talented people faced with those kinds of decisions now have the ability to go to Silicon Valley and make far more money than they can working for NSA or CIA. So we have that challenge. And then there are bureaucratic challenges, and, and those are things like security clearances and being able to, um, to keep security clearances if you come to the intelligence community. So, so that's one of the things that we need to work on to make sure that we're better positioned. The other challenge is, is technology, and we've talked a lot about that, but I, I view that as the great equalizer. I talk about cybersecurity, for instance, and the, the things, you know, countries like, like Russia, um, China, North Korea, Iran, others that, that can't compete with us kinetically, can compete with us in cyberspace um, and can compete with us. They realize that techno technology is the way to close the gap. And so, as I talked about before, making sure that we're investing in artificial intelligence and 
you know, uh, data and the application of data is so important at the end of the day to who is going to stay on top as we, as we advance technologically. And other countries recognize that. We've got to make sure that we're attracting, retaining the talent that allows us to do that and that we're investing in a way that keeps us ahead of our competitors. That's well put on the technology side. I, I have long argued that it is a fallacy to, to make a statement, a blanket statement, that this is a cold start when it comes to great power competition and that the past 20 years hasn't already led us down the path of honing the technological means of uh, the men and women in the intelligence community serving at Fort Meade in the National Security Agency, the National Geospatial, and as I lovingly call them, the alphabet soup of, of these organizations that do so much to protect our country. But now it's really about shifting that technology with greater emphasis against the great power competition. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems that we have is, you know, um, we don't talk about our successes. Our, our, it's our failures that get highlighted and, and talked about in, in a public discourse. But as the director of national intelligence for the past year, those successes that, we, that you've talked about and seeing those, um, we're not at a cold start. We, we do so many things so well. And it's, it's why I can um, sit here and say we have the best intelligence enterprise and we have you know, uh, the, the ability for that to continue into the future so long as we're smart about the decisions that we make going forward. One of the propositions that emerged out of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of uh, 2004 was very much building a community that shared information. And one of the challenges until my, um, uh, my graduation from government work, as I like to call it, in 2015 was that some of the biggest obstacles were actually cultural inside the IC of elements working with each other. Talk a little bit about that in terms of what the future requires of the information sharing, obviously with the, uh, the need to protect information, and, and that sort of thing. How do you see that challenge against the uh, adversaries that you talked about in this first third of the, of the conversation? Yeah, I think you know, one of the challenges there is you know, when you have autocratic um, uh, regimes like in China and the way that their system works and it's closed and it's easy to close things off, it's, it's harder. The one of the challenges that we have is we're, we're, we're an open society which means we're open to everyone, including our adversaries. And, um, and open source information is, you know, increasingly has to become a focus of the intelligence community and how we get information. Um, and so, you know, I, within the community itself, when you talk about information sharing, this goes back to, you know, the point that I make in, in, in terms of what is important and our ability to share information really has defined and will define our successes moving forward. So use 9-11 as an example of that is, you know, where we didn't have the ability to share all of our best intelligence and information, it led to what was an, an intelligence failure, if you will. And um, we have to make sure that those things don't happen. And the best way to do that is to be making sure that, you know, within agencies, within the intelligence community, that we're sharing information the best way, the fastest way, um, and building an architecture that allows us to do that um, in a way um, that, uh, that really serves our national security posture. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the value proposition around open source information. Uh, growing up professionally in an intelligence community that there was a preponderance of weight given to classified information, that is, clandestinely acquired, whatever means associated with uh, acquiring of those secrets, the stealing of those secrets, if you will, was that open source was at best third class type of information. Well, we live in an information age, though, where this enormous amount of open source information ranging from open available to uh, subscription rated and moving that information all the way to the dark web. So a very broad definition of open source. Can you talk a little about that role as DNI as you see the future and this greater reliance on the exploitation processing and use and leveraging of open source information? 
Yeah, I mean, the way you uh, described open source information, the way it used to be is, uh, you know, couldn't be further from the truth to where we are now. And, and you know, so much, in, even in the short period of time, um, you know, for the past year where I was the director of national intelligence, so much focus on open source information because it is so valuable. I mean, there's a famous quote from um, now, now become famous, I think Eric Schmidt at Google talking about how much information we generate now just in a matter of days, which used to be information that would that, it, that would be generated over over decades. And and so, you know, with that recognition about how rapidly things are expanding and this information gets out so quickly and is so valuable. And, and really how when we talk about aspects like um, machine learning, how the 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 um, you know the implementation and application of data from open source material and information, you know, really drives our advances in that, and why countries like China that are devoting, you know, so many resources towards that, those are one of the challenges that we've got to we've got to meet that and exceed that moving forward. And so, a good segue then into what should the public-private partnership be as it pertains to open source? Because clearly, you mentioned Silicon Valley and the attraction of the salaries, but that's only one part of it. Yet there seems to almost be, in some instances, an adversarial relationship by those same big data producers, either with national security more broadly or the intelligence community more specifically. And I won't name names, but I think we, we know their feelings in some instances about uh, the intelligence community. And, and so how, how, do, how do we navigate that in terms of the relationship of the public-private relationship on big data? We've got to build trust, and so we have to use, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, circumstances that uh, where our where the failure to to work more closely and overcome some of those uh, challenges and some of that mistrust have worked against us, and and use the recent examples, for instance, the solar winds um, as you know a learning experience for like. The only way we prevent this from happening is for there to be more public-private partnerships and, a, and an ability to, you know, work more closely to identify threats uh, and some of the challenges that are there that the government can't do alone and Silicon Valley and, and our technology centers in the private sector can't do alone where, where we are strongest together. And, you know, and so that is really, as, as we look at the challenges moving forward, one of the things um, in an open society that we've really got to focus on and do a better job. So I have two more questions before we turn to the audience for their questions. And uh, I think the last 20 years have strengthened in many ways um, our allies and partners in terms of the relationship with the intelligence community because of the war zones, and mm -hmm. so be it NATO, in Afghanistan or uh, when they were still there in Iraq and, and that sort of thing. Talk a little bit about your perspective as now former DNI about the importance of leveraging these relationships around the globe in partnership in meeting these threats. So you know as a as spending your career in this space that you know, I can't go into detail about a, a the, so the, the relationships we have with so many countries, the things that we do together where we have successes that uh, because we have great partners around the world that we share intelligence with. Um, th as the director of national intelligence, you see that you see that up close. And so I I look at, for instance, countries like Australia, you know, one of our five eye partners and where they are in the world in proximity to China and the threat that that um, poses and how they need us and we need them to meet that challenge, for instance, of a, of a rising China and how we have um, worked together. They're really at the tip of the spear, if you will, um, because of where they are um, and the challenges that we're facing. I look at uh, other Five Eye partners like um, like the UK and, and our ability to work with them and convince them why Huawei shouldn't um, gain a foothold in the UK, you know, with regard to 5G and sort of countering China's uh, ability there. So those are just some examples of 
um, how those relationships are so important and have really have shaped and will continue to shape our national security posture and, and, and the posture uh, around the world for free markets and, and free market principles. Um, and so, you know, those, those relationships are vitally important and they're very strong. One of the challenges that we have right now, I think people can recognize this, is um, Europe is, has been taking what some have characterized as trying to find a third way, sort of trying to navigate between not getting into direct conflict with either China or the United States when it comes to some of these, these issues. And, and, you know, the discussions that I would have as a director of national intelligence would be to, to, con to convince some of our partners in Europe why, um, you know, they need to be closely aligned with the United States and why they can't compete with China. They're not big enough to compete with China on some of the platforms, for instance, with regard to artificial intelligence and other things. And so those are partnerships that have to get better and we need to work more closely as we address the threats around the world. Yeah, and I like to think that the great power competition or competitors allow for new opportunities for either deepening the partnerships with non-traditional ones, right? or expanding it into areas where they have a comparative advantage that, again, the United States might not have, and places like India and Brazil come to mind. Very different locations, obviously, where you can deepen that partnership when it comes to intelligence uh, sharing as the first line of defense. And I think there is a, a, a very close relationship then to building the defense capabilities of the United States around that intelligence relationship. It, th would you agree that there are new opportunities as a result of these uh, challenges that we face? Uh, it very well said. I mean, I think that you gave two specific examples. There are many others. Many. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and that's, again, part of when we talk about making sure that our intelligence enterprise and apparatus is, is the best in the world. It's, it's developing those opportunities. And, and again, to give people a, a, a sense of how we're positioned, I really think that we're doing that. And I think that we're, you know, the intelligence community is meeting the challenge um, in that respect and, and why I'm optimistic moving forward. That's great. Well, my, my last question is, and it's a little bit of a, of a crystal ball type. Um, if you were still DNI and it's 2022, 2023, what one thing that you really wanted to accomplish didn't give you enough time to do as it pertained to the intelligence community vis-a-vis, -vis, again, the nature of the threats? And obviously in an unclassified environment, we can't go into details of it, but was there kind of one big unfinished thing that you wanted to, that you would have tried to accomplish with longer, a longer tenure as DNI? Right, well, so I've talked about it a little bit, but I think this is, a, is an example, you know, I always say that uh, you know China is our greatest national security threat from a nation state perspective. Um, but as you know, before I became before I became DNI, I, I chaired the cybersecurity subcommittee on the Homeland Security uh, and 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 have dealt with those issues. I was one of the more prolific cyber legislators. Cybersecurity as a as a threat to um, you know our position in the world, uh, you know I call it the great equalizer again, where where um, where we need to get better, where our adversaries see that, you know, uh, for instance, a, a country like Iran can't compete with us kinetically, but in cyberspace, they can come a lot closer. And, and again, going back to, to things like the solar winds attack, it really demonstrates where our, where our vulnerabilities are. And right now, very clearly, that incident and, and others like Hafnium and some of the other uh, things that, uh, that, have, that have taken place really sort of underscore that um, from a cyber per perspective, we need to get better about our defenses. And, you know, one of the challenges, as you know, David, is that, you know, people say, well, the, why didn't the intelligence community stop this? You know, the NSA and the CIA are precluded uh, from a domestic standpoint of using these authorities. And we trust um, DHS and the FBI to be the first line of defense um, with, re with regard to some of these events that, that I've talked about. And, and the capability just isn't there. And so addressing that in a way that will allow for um, these types of events from uh, preventing these types of events from occurring in the future would have been a focus of mine. Yeah, it would have been a great area of focus and we certainly hope that um, 
Abriel Haynes as the present DNI is is uh, tackling that kind of issue because it is such a priority for our nation. So I'm going to turn to Dustin for questions from the audience, and uh, he's been taking them in. Dustin Carmack just recently rejoined Heritage and uh, delighted to have him here as a colleague as well and former chief of staff to uh, DNI Ratcliffe. Good morning, sir. Uh, first question is actually from a student at Patrick Henry College. He asked, uh, Silicon Valley is uh, often being seen as being against uh, supporting law enforcement and intelligence agencies when it comes to national security issues. How can the IC develop a partnership with tech moguls to counter China's threat to our IT infrastructure? Well, I think that, that uh, that's not actually a fair characterization. Uh, I don't see uh, Silicon Valley as um, uh, adverse to you know, the IC and the things that we're trying to do or law enforcement. Um, again, some of these things have happened behind the scenes that, that you don't see. I mean, unfortunately, a lot was was focused on, you know, uh, the iPhone and the ability to get into iPhone on, from an encryption standpoint. But there are so many other circumstances where really the intelligence community, law enforcement, and Silicon Valley are working together uh, in great partnerships. Um, and I, I, as I mentioned to David, I think that, you know, some, unfortunately, sometimes it's the problems that we face, the crisis or the challenges that we've had or the failures, if you will, that provide opportunity to improve those relationships and build trust um, because there's a recognition that if we're not working together, we're not gonna solve these things. And, and um, you know, and so, uh, you know, I, I do, I am optimistic that we're getting better with respect to that. Again, to the point that I made to David earlier, unfortunately, the public discussion that would that leads to that question is is a is a misimpression because we're only we're only talking about our failures and the challenges we're not talking about all of the successes and and so what i would say is we have a lot of successes in in terms of partnerships behind closed doors great one uh, one area that uh, we haven't focused on so far that has been seen as more pressing in recent years is the uh, substance of financial intelligence uh, with the you know advancements in cryptocurrencies and where we see the Chinese just releasing a digital yuan here, uh, just here recently. How do you view the, the use of financial intelligence from your lens at your time at DNI? Well, fortunately, in this country, we would talk about um, sort of the gold standard in terms of uh, protecting um, industries, protecting themselves. The financial industry um, really does a good job. Um, Having said that, you know the challenges with technology is 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 no one is safe with regard to this. And you know financial intelligence, um, you know, is is vitally important. Um, that would be an understatement. Um, you know, so much as you know, uh, Dustin, in our time uh, together at the office of the director of national intelligence, really focused on on these issues and the challenges that we faced with regard to. Um, financial intelligence and the role that it plays in identifying bad actors around the world and and how we track and trace them um, and so you know our ability to continue to develop that through all different types of intelligence human intelligence and signals intelligence you know um, uh, really uh, is a vital part of uh, the intelligence you know apparatus uh, another question from a student at Patrick Henry College uh, China considers their national policies in very lengthy timeframes. What do you consider the greatest area of growth that the intelligence community needs in terms of capabilities in the next 10 years? Well, I think in terms of how we spend our money, this is one of the things I think you and I, you know, talked about. One of the things that the, the director of national intelligence has, um, you know, a, a great amount of influence is, um, you know, control over the budgets of the national intelligence program and the military intelligence program. And so, you know, the where to spend that money, in other words, um, you know, should it be on satellites or should it be on, um, you know, uh, other aspects within the intelligence community that, that improve um, our ability to collect intelligence. And I think that what we've, what we've seen is when we talk about different types of in information, human intelligence is always important. Signals intelligence is always important. But as we get into sort of the geospatial intelligence and and how that has has helped and 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 shaped 
um, you know, the intelligence uh, uh, capabilities moving forward, that's an area where we're spending more money and where I think we should be spending more money, um, you know, into the future. We talked about space as an important domain. The Chinese view it as a military domain. Um, you know, we focused and talked about making it an intelligence domain because it's so important. So I think in terms of how we spend our money, one of the areas as we focus is, is, is space and how that can provide an advantage within the intelligence community for us. Because again, we don't have a near peer competitor there. Wouldn't you agree that that's an opportunity also for the various agencies to work closer together inside the intelligence community? Two things, it cuts down on duplication of labor, but it's a force multiplier to have them working more closely together in terms of the budgets on this sort of 10 year outlook question that came from uh, from this student. Absolutely, I mean, you know, one of the constant challenges is, um, is making sure that um, you know, all of the intelligence agencies are working together and, and um, you know, that's one of the roles of the Director of National Intelligence and, and the office was to, you know, to better integrate those efforts. And I, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's very much a work in progress, but it's, it's an endeavor that is worthwhile and important. And we talked a lot about that in my time there, about how we could improve that and how, you, you can't just have, for instance, CIA or other of the more well-known intelligence agencies really um, driving the ship, that really uh, it has to be all oars in the water, all pulling in the same direction, and everyone feeling like they have a, a, a voice in terms of the direction that the intelligence community goes. And, and that'll, that'll be, uh, you know, for, for Director Haynes, that's one of the things that she and I talked about in the transition moving forward is, is um, sort of carrying forward that momentum and continuing to improve the sharing of information between the intelligence communities to make it stronger across the board. Uh, we have a viewer who would like to hear your views on uh, Iran and particularly the relationship between Iran and China and Iran and Russia when you're talking about uh, adversaries. So, you know, uh, Iran is, uh, you know, as we talked about, um, it has been a destabilizing force in the Middle East for, for a long period of time, uh, both directly and um, through proxies, uh, through militias, through Hezbollah, through Hamas. And, you know, fortunately, and I don't want to get, you know, political in terms of some of the policy positions, but, but I think everyone would, would agree looking objectively at Iran is that they are poorer, weaker, and less influential as a result of of some of the sanctions that have been implemented uh, against them, and they, they haven't had the ability to, they can't afford to engage in the kind of mayhem um, that they have, and they haven't been able to bully, uh, for lack of a better term, um, you know, for instance, UAE and Bahrain from entering into peace agreements with Israel. All of that, you know, bodes well for that for that area, and and I think the intelligence that that I saw really reflects that. Um, that that we should, as a country, be doing the things that are uh, that will facilitate and foster continuing to move things in that direction. And so, you know, that that is, I, I think, where Iran is right now. And what you see um, uh, is, you know, they are trying to develop their relationship with both China and Russia because the you know the U.S. position has been so strong, and the maximum pressure campaign has hurt them so much. And and I think that this 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 really reflects where um, this is where we have to make sure that not just the United States but our allies are working with us to counter that. And um, we shouldn't let China or Russia um, uh, rehabilitate um, aspects of the Iranian regime that right now are struggling. It's a good thing when uh, Iran doesn't have the ability to engage in the kind of mayhem that really they've, they've been allowed to engage in for the past 20 years under both Republican and Democrat um, administrations. Just, just building on that, it, it's interesting how uh, this now multi-dimensional uh, world that we're in these alliances that are made. Uh, could you 
sort of talk a word, say a word about Turkey in the midst of all of this to that last question about Iran, Russia, and China. But Turkey's playing a very interesting role. So we talk a lot uh, in the intelligence community about Erdogan and, and Turkey um, and you know what he is trying to accomplish right now um, uh, in Turkey. And uh, as you uh, alluded to, David, they are they're becoming a bigger player, a more active player in so many places, um, you know, in Libya and in, and in other places where uh, you see the Turkish um, uh, influence expanding. What you also see is a, is, a, is a friction between Turkey and Russia and the competition there. Um, there's, there's an odd relationship uh, between Erdogan and Putin. They, um, they, they, they almost fight like brothers, if you will. They, 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 they have a lot of aligned and shared interests, but yet those interests come into conflict. And, and so we see that flare up where um, Turkey and Russia in different places um, are really at odds with one another. But at the end of the day, um, they're both trying to expand their sphere of influence. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, again, Turkey is um, within the intelligence community taking up a lot more of our bandwidth than they were just even a few years ago. Right. It's interesting. They sit on that divide between the, the Middle East and, and, of course, the West in terms of that relationship. One, one final question, given our, our time uh, here today, and it's, it's kind of the big aha question. Uh, if you were to walk into, an, into the uh, situation room, and in a meeting presided by the president, but his national security cabinet portion sitting in that room. And you had the opportunity to talk about a surprise, a black swan event that worries you. And I know you've talked a bit about the cyber area and uh, that as well, but what would you want them to say worries you in that particular way? And as it relates to the intelligence community to give it coverage, in terms of that, as we are 15 months into a pandemic that wasn't foreseen, at least at, in, in broad strokes, in terms of certainly the impact of what the pandemic has had for, for the last uh, 15 months, 16 right. months. And so what, what kind of black swan, big event, surprise would you want to brief this uh, situation room that we, both of us spent so much time in at different times in our, our uh, History. Well, you know, by definition, the black swan is, is really something that is um, uh, something that you don't foresee and that is not imaginable. And, and you know, the one that, you know, best example that I can think of um, is 9-11. You know, 9-11 was it was an intelligence failure because we had we had the intelligence between law enforcement and intelligence. If we had had the law allowed it, put it together. And the foreign and domestic piece. And the yeah, foreign and domestic piece. But what it really was, was it was a failure of imagination. We didn't think of um, people turning planes into missiles into, into our buildings. The pandemic that you mentioned, David, is interesting because we actually have been concerned about pandemics and the possibility of pandemics and have talked about it in threat assessments in, in prior years. But to your point about you know, the scope of it and, you know, the impact of it uh, moving forward. So, you know, uh, I guess if I were, um, if I were trying to talk about what we don't imagine uh, or, or what we're trying to predict what isn't there, I do go back to the, to the cyber aspect of things because each of those events really are, are, are sort of small black swans, if you will, the solar winds, for example. And, um, and again, with more focus from other countries all on that aspect of it, I think that um, it is realistic to, to think that those events are going to, until, you know, as the saying goes, and, and until we're able to stop it, they're going to continue. Why, why wouldn't we see more of those types of black swan events on the cyber front where, um, so much damage can be afflicted from so far away, half a world in a few strokes in a, in a few seconds, or through, you know, through the, through the type of um, sort of sinister, uh, you know, supply chain uh, infiltration that the Russians um, uh, deployed with solar winds. Those are going to unfortunately 
continue to be black swan events until, as we talked about, we, we change either our authorities or our approach in terms of partnerships to, to addressing those problems, you know, um, we won't know that they're coming, but they're going to continue to come. And, I, and you, you put your finger on it. I think we all suffer from this, is that inability to imagine. Because oftentimes, as, as people who are uh, driven to do the right thing, we don't think what the bad folks will do out there. The bad people intended on that, be it from organized crime, be it from state actors, we don't put ourselves quite in their shoes for what that would look like. And I think another word that's kind of ill-defined now strategically is deterrence. Right. And I think that's another area that we could spend a lot of time both in the intelligence and, and the policy side thinking about. What does deterrence look like as we've applied it to the former Soviet Union when it came to nuclear forces and that sort of thing? Right. And I think, you know, when we talk about that uh, from that perspective, um, you know, imagination, and this, this gets into why the intelligence community and the role that we play and how we are able to, to gather, collect, and analyze intelligence is as technology plays an increasing role in our life, the intelligence community really has the first, um, you know, is the first line of defense in saying, okay, so now we're learning about this new technology that we're picking up on. How could it be used? Now, how could we think about, you know, um, the way our adversaries might deploy it. And, and that's really how, you know, the intelligence community has to be focused on sort of um, imagining what is currently unimaginable and, and preventing the future type of black swan events. As I like to say, it gets them out of their inbox or their in screen to actually stand back and, and think strategically around that. And, and that's actually vital for our country in terms of what it can deliver by way of thought and, and potential actions then by the policymaker and the warfighter as they think about what's what's looming over the horizon that fewer people perhaps are thinking about. Right. But, but with that, I want to thank you for today. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. I want to thank the audience uh, that's out there. Uh, much better to have done it in person, but uh, it, it, I'm delighted that we could do this uh, meeting together on this. Dustin, thank you for, for your assistance and and the whole team here at Heritage to make this event possible. And I, I, I believe we've given people some real food for thought. You've really brought a perspective both on the nature of the threats and the intelligence community that will be very valuable. Well, I appreciate it. It's always great to be with you and uh, enjoy the time together. Thank you. And uh, I am supposed to pass on that in fact, immediately following the event, there will be a survey that we hope you'll complete and bring ideas that you care about to the public square. To see the events we have coming up, check out the heritage.org slant events. And again, thank you everyone and have a wonderful day and wonderful week ahead. Thank you.